Good afternoon. Welcome to Convocation. Thanks for coming today. My name is Steve Peterson. I teach the class for all of you who are here for credit. And those of you who aren't but are here as visitors and have come to hear today's presenter, thanks for coming. How many of you came from uh, bowling with Bob Trithal? Yeah. I think you, if you talk to him, he'll give you extra credit for coming today. And according to him, most of you need it. So I would make the arrangements for the extra credit if I were you. Next week for Convocation, it's the International Student Week. And don't forget to go to the International Student Food Fest. That's one of the greatest feeds here on campus during the entire year. And we have, uh, we had the, the uh, Secretary of State from the Republic of Congo coming to talk, but he's having some political issues, so we're not sure he'll be here. But we do have the Burundi dancers from the Congo, drummers and dancers from Africa next week for convocation. Don't miss that one, all right? Also a reminder, take out your cell phones. Be sure to turn those off. I can see a blue face right there. Yeah, there it goes. I can see a blue face right up there. Thank you. We don't want to interrupt today's presentation. Amber Lee Snyder was a student here at Snow College, sitting where you guys are sitting not too long ago, only she always sat on the back row, so I got to talk to her during convocation. And uh, in 2011, in the fall, we were watching a presenter, and she said to me, you know, I think I could do that. And I said, Amber Lee, why don't you try it? We'll uh, arrange a convocation for next spring. And sure enough, she did a convocation presentation, and at the end of the semester, when I would ask students, what was your favorite presentation? Was it the pianist from Hungary? Was it the international dancers? No, it was Amberly Snyder. I don't know if you knew that. You were very, very popular that year. Uh, since then, she's gone on to do uh, motivational speeches throughout the country, I, I suppose. Hundreds, she told me. She can't remember how many she's done. I'm not going to tell you her story because her story is what she's going to tell you. And uh, I'm sure you're all going to enjoy today's presentation. Please give a welcome back to former Snow College student, Amberly Snyder. Right now? Okay, now you can hear me. Okay, I need five volunteers. So if five of you will just come up here to the stage, that's what I need. <laughs> one, two, three, four, I need one more. Five. Okay, now be thinking about it because I'm gonna need three more of you later on. Okay, of you five up here, guys, where are the girls? I wanna know why they're all guys up here. <laughs> Okay, so I uh, have a question for you guys. How many of you in here have ever ridden in a wheelchair? Driven one, ridden in one, played in one? Ish. You have. Don't lie. So you have. You haven't. And you haven't. Of you two, do either of you want to ride in my wheelchair? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> he spoke up first, so he's going to ride in my wheelchair. So this is what I'm going to need. Um, you two right here, I'm going to need you to put a foot on either side of this board and just hold it from on either side. Either side, guys. Either side. One, one foot over here. No, no, no. This foot right here. Turn your butt to them. <laughs> there, now. One foot there and one foot here. Oh, like this? There! Okay. We're going to get it. Okay, because your job is to not let that board move. All right? Easy. You and you. Come here. I need you guys to come one on each side of me, please. Come a little closer. Come a little closer. Come just a little bit closer. I won't bite you. Okay. I need you two to not move. I don't care if the fire alarm goes off. You guys are not moving. Got it? Hey, don't. I didn't move. Okay. All right, you, tell me your name. Truman. Truman. So Truman here is going to get in my wheelchair quickie. Yes, that's my wheelchair's name. And uh, do this obstacle course for you all. So Truman, here's my wheelchair. <laughs> You're going to need to wheel around. Go backwards through these two boys without hitting them or me. Wheel through these cones. Jump that board. 
And if you do all of that completely stellar, I need you to wheelie in a circle. Okay. <laughs> so, you, these guys first. Go, go first. Don't run over my toe. I'm not going to. I mean, I can't feel it, but that doesn't make it appropriate. <laughs> yep, backwards through them. You guys cannot move. Your toes are in harm's way, but I don't really care. I can't feel anything from the waist down. I broke my Oh, back. you're good too. You can run his feet over then. That's still not recommended, please. <laughs> oh, can I run your Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Give Truman a round of applause. He's made it through the first obstacle. You just need to weave through those cones. Now, don't hit those cones. Remember when you were little and you played like hot lava? That's what these cones are. Uh, and you're hitting one. <laughs> Thank you for the sound effect. That was what we needed. <laughs> Where's the sound? Thank you. <laughs> okay, now jump this board. Now, wait a minute. Before you jump this board, I am not liable for any injury or death that could occur during this obstacle. Also, wait one second. I need you two to just stand behind him, you know, just in case. <laughs> yep, jump it. Jump boards, I just jump them all the time, you know, just for fun. Oh, look at this board, let me jump it. Okay, I will give you one more try, and then I'm going to need Quickie back. Okay, give him a round of applause. Okay, do you want to try to wheelie in a circle? Now, before you do that, let me just tell you, my chair is worth $7,000, so if you break him, you might have to replace him. You're right. I don't know how to do that, so I'll just go Okay, ahead and, uh, you'll give me it back. <laughs> give Truman a round of applause for doing my obstacle course. Okay, jump out, and I'll park it. Okay, I just need you to hold. Him still. Perfect like that. Okay. Let me get back in here. Okay, you, you two, you three can go sit down. You two need to stay there. Give them a round of applause for their help. Okay, so you guys saw this obstacle course that I had Truman do. I had him go backwards through these two boys. I had him wheelie through these cones. And then he was going to have to jump this board. No, thank you. Okay, you guys can sit down. Thank you, guys. So if he had done all of that completely stellar, I wanted him to wheelie in a circle. These are obstacles that I face every day, trying to not run people over, weave in and out of tight split spaces, going over objects and wheeling are obstacles that I do on a daily basis. They were harder for Truman because he's not used to them. I shouldn't compare what I'm going through to what Truman's gone through, and he shouldn't compare his obstacles to mine either. Everyone in here is going to face something different. Doesn't make yours any less hard, it just makes it different. So I wanna tell you guys about my brother. This is my brother, Taylor. So in my family, baseball is kind of a big deal. My dad played in the major leagues for nine and a half years, and uh, you know, if you're gonna play baseball, you better be good at it. Let me just say, like, I tried to play softball one year, and my dad came up to me and said, oh, you better just stick to what you do normally. Yeah. So my brother, playing baseball, pretty dang good. 
At 12 years old, he was getting asked to play on accelerated teams all around the nation. Well, at the end of his 12-year-old summer, his elbow started to hurt. How many of you in here play sports? How many of you in here have ever had an injury? So if your arm starts to hurt, kind of a big deal. So my brother goes in and gets an MRI done on it, finds out that the cartilage is dying and the bone is starting to decay. The doctor says, Taylor, there's nothing I can do for this. There's no surgery I can give you to fix this. There's no medication that I can prescribe you that's going to heal this. Your chances of baseball are probably over. He said, Taylor, the only thing I can give you to do is wait. You can just wait. You can wait and hope that it'll heal. So my brother at 12 years old decides that's what he wants to do. He knows that he loves baseball. He knows that he wants to wait to play that sport. Two years goes by. He finally gets cleared to start playing baseball again. Two weeks later, breaks that same arm on a skateboard. Has to get surgery. Has to wait even longer to play. But he did. He knew what he wanted to accomplish, and he didn't care how long it was going to take or what the odds were. He knew what he wanted to do. So now I can brag about my brother a little bit. He graduated last year from Salem Hills High School, was Offensive Player of the Year, led the state in doubles, and was offered a draft by the Seattle Mariners. This would have never happened if he'd given up at 12 years old. If at 12 years old he had decided, okay, you know what, I'm not supposed to hit a stupid ball with a stick, I'm supposed to do something else, he would have never got that far. So, speaking of my brother, he killed my cat. Yeah, you heard me right, he killed my cat. This is my little kitty, Foxy. I got Foxy one weekend at a college rodeo. I didn't pull a check and I wanted to come home with something. Foxy was free at Walmart. So I brought him home instead. So this little Foxy, every time, well, I was living here at Snow College at the time, and uh, I'd go home every weekend. And I got a little pet carrier for Foxy, but he would cry and cry and cry. So of course, I'd let him out. So this is what Foxy would do. I'd be driving in my truck from here to home or home to here, and uh, I'd set him on the passenger seat. He'd walk across the middle of the seat. He would jump on my lap and start climbing up my shirt. I would rip him off and say, Foxy, don't you dare do that again. I would set him back over on the passenger side. That cat would walk across the middle of the truck, jump on my lap, and start climbing up my shirt. I would say, if you do this one more time, I'm throwing you out the window. And I'd put him back over. What do you think he did? Oh, he came walking across the middle of the truck and jumped on my lap. I said, I will kill you. He didn't care. So, one day, I thought, you know what? I'm going to see where this little kitty wants to go. So I set him on the passenger side. You guys know the routine. He walks across the middle of the truck, jumps on my lap, starts climbing up my shirt, goes around my back, and plops on the top of my head. Totally content, fell asleep there. This little cat that drove me crazy taught me a lesson. Rest in peace. Now I can look back at that and think, that little cat didn't care how many times I told him no. He didn't care how many times I threatened to throw him out the window. He didn't care how many times I told him, you are not going to get where you want to go. He did it anyway. So my brother and this little cat taught me something. You never realized how close you were to success when you gave up. If either of them had given up at any point in time, they would have never accomplished what they wanted to. Everyone in here has the potential to do something great. But don't let somebody else decide what you're going to be capable of. Don't let somebody else tell you, no, you can't do that. Because it's up to you. It's up to you to decide what you're going to accomplish. So the next story I want to tell you about, it was two months after my accident, and uh, I was going on my first date. You guys can all think back to your first date, you know, however old you were. Were you nervous? 
If you say no, you're lying. Because <laughs> everyone is nervous on your first date, even if you are the most smoking hot jock or cheerleader in the world. You are nervous on your first date. So this is my first date after my accident. I am nervous. So we go out to dinner. Everything so far is going great. Well, we come out of the restaurant, and lo and behold, there's this curb. Now, I've learned how to go down curbs. It's one of the things I had to learn when I was in the hospital. You just get in a wheelie, get right up next to it, pop on down. Piece of cake, right? So, I get ready for this curb, about to go down it. And at this point, I was new to being in a wheelchair. And it frustrated me when people asked me if I needed help. It irritated me. Now, I love help. But at that point, it bugged me. So I get ready for this curb, and this boy says, Hey, Am, do you need any help? I said, no, I can do this. Now, let me just get this straight with you guys. What happens next is his fault. <laughs> you all know in here, right? It's always the boy's fault. Thank you. It's his fault. We're all clear. So I get ready for this curb, I get, and I'm about to go down, and he says, hey, Am, do you need any help? And I said, no, I've got this. Well, of course he distracted me. So one wheel goes down before the other. When that happens in a wheelchair, you flip over. So here I am flipped over in this parking lot thinking, oh my gosh, my nightmare just came true. He looks at me and he says, do you need any, need any help now? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to need your help. So he comes in front of me and gives me his hand. <laughs> I said, OK, uh, I don't really think that's going to work. He's like, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, really, guys, what do you do when a girl in a wheelchair flips over? Do you cry? Do you laugh? Do you pretend like you didn't see? He's not really sure how to handle this situation. So he says, what do you want me to do? I said, princess carry me, that's what I call it. I said, put your arm underneath my knees behind my back and pick me up. Easy. So he says, okay, I, I can do that. Now, I have to tell you, before I told him to do this, I had to make sure he was going to be able to pick me up. He was a bull rider. I thought he could probably handle it. So he comes over, picks me up. We both look back down. Wheelchair still flipped over. <laughs> he starts kicking at my wheelchair. He's kicking at it and kicking at it and kicking at it. Finally gets it to stand up. The brakes weren't on. So it starts rolling across the parking lot. Just picture this with me, guys. Boy carrying girl chasing wheelchair across the parking lot. That is what is happening on my first date. Oh my gosh. So I finally get back in my wheelchair and uh, this couple walks out of the restaurant. Of course, nobody was around when this all happened. This couple walks out of the restaurant, and I was like, light bulb. I'm going to make this funny for me now. So I looked at the couple, looked at the boy, looked back to the couple and said, can you believe this kid? He just dumped me out of my wheelchair. <laughs> he was petrified. Hey, it was his fault in the beginning, right? So this experience was one where I was literally knocked down. I mean, I was laying on my back in a parking lot. I had to get the help, but I was able to get back up. When you guys are in a situation and you see somebody that needs help, don't be afraid to ask. I'm telling you, yeah, in the beginning I was kind of offended when people asked for help, but now I absolutely love it. And even there's times when I'm in a situation where I really need the help, but nobody offers because I think they're worried to offend me. So in any situation that you're in, be willing to help somebody. So I want to show you guys this video. I actually did this here at Snow College. You guys will probably recognize a few places on campus. And uh, it's called the bystander effect, so I'll let you watch it.
somebody that's flipped over right next to you in class? Okay, that girl sitting next to me, she was not in on this. I, okay, Mr. Marsing was. I told him, to, I told him that, because the point of the bystander effect is that you look to whoever's in charge and you tell them, you know, whatever they're going to do, then you do. So I told him to pretend like he didn't notice. But really? So on this campus, I just want to tell you, like I have this quote that says, the simple act of caring is heroic. I hope that you guys are willing to help each other in any situation that you're in. I mean, be more than just yourself in your own world. Be willing to help other people. So, I want to tell you guys about 2009. So think about where you were in 2009. I was um, 18. I was serving as state FFA president and found out that I wanted to be a teacher. Way cool thing to find out what you want to do for the rest of your life. Secondly, I was competing in rodeo. So I've been riding horses since I was three years old, competing in rodeo since I was seven. It's not what I do, it's who I am. This year, I made it to, well, in 2009, I made it to the National Finals Rodeo of high school, and then I made it to a Finals Rodeo the week after in Colorado and came home with two saddles and 11 buckles and over $500. Pretty good week, guys. To come home with a World and Finals all-around title, I'm the only person that got to leave with that. So, on top of that, I had a, graduated from high school the year before with a 4.0, and had not only applied to scholarge, uh, scholarges, had not only applied to colleges, but had been offered scholarships. I'm telling you, 2009. I was really the happiest girl in the entire world. This picture is January 10th, 2010, at about 9, 30, 10 o'clock in the morning. If you guys can see, I don't know if you can, but there, I don't have a seatbelt on right there. I had stopped in Rollins, Wyoming at a gas station, and when I got back in my truck, I hadn't put it back on yet. I was just changing CDs, grabbing a drink out of my back seat, hadn't done it yet. I'd been offered a job in Denver at the stock show for two and a half weeks. Okay, girls, when you pack, you pack a lot. When you pack for two and a half weeks, you pack everything. That bag on the top behind my head, the blue one, that's just my shoes. So I had packed almost everything I owned inside this truck with me and started my drive to Denver. I'd left Logan at about 4.30 that morning to begin the drive. Like I said, I stopped in Rollins, Wyoming at a gas station, got back in, hadn't put my seatbelt back on yet. Less than 10 miles down the road, my life completely changed. I was going through Sinclair, Wyoming, and I looked down to check my map. When I looked up, I'd faded over a lane and was heading towards a mile marker on the side of the road. I grabbed my wheel and tried to correct my truck. I thought, as long as I don't roll, I'll be okay. Guys, I drove an F-150, 35-inch tires, 6-inch lift. It was high off the ground. So I grabbed my wheel with both hands and tried to bring my truck back straight. Right as I thought, okay, I've got this, I'm going to be okay. My back right tire caught the dirt on the side of the freeway and pulled me completely sideways. I left my truck going 70 miles an hour and hit this on the side of the road. Crossed my stomach. Wrapped around it, broke it off, carried it another 20 feet with a fence. When I opened up my eyes, I was sitting on the side of the freeway. I could see my truck in front of me, and I thought, I'm just glad I'm not in that. If I was in that, I probably wouldn't be here. So I can see all my stuff scattered for yards around me. I realized I was thinking straight. I looked at my fingers. I could move them. Looked down to my toes. Tried to move them. Nothing happened. At that point, I realized I'm sitting in a snowbank, yet I feel like I'm in warm water from the waist down. I started pinching and rubbing out my legs, trying to feel something. There was nothing. So all I could do was wait. So I waited for somebody to come, somebody to come and help me, and it took five to ten minutes before the first guy showed up. He asked me what happened. I said, I rolled my truck. I said, I was ejected, and I can't feel my legs. 
I get loaded in the ambulance. Well, let me tell you, before I get loaded in the ambulance, I had to make a phone call. I decided I was going to call my dad. This is how this phone call went. Hey, Dad. Um, I got in a car wreck. He said, well, how bad? I said, pretty bad. I rolled my truck. He said, are you OK? I said, um, I can't feel my legs. He said, Amberly, are you paralyzed? I said, Dad, I don't know. I'm just telling you, I can't feel my legs from the waist down. At that point, the cop had showed up on the accident site, and I said, call Mom. you got to tell her. And I was loaded in the ambulance, taken back to Rollins in the hospital. As I'm laying in Rollins, I get told the news. I get told that the chances of me walking are slim to none, but more to the none. So guys, within an instant, I went from this, this is my senior picture, one of my senior pictures, to this. Neck brace, backboard, can't feel my legs, getting life flighted into surgery. Five hours later, I leave surgery with, eh, rods about this long in my back, 14 screws. Chances of me walking, not going to happen. So I tell my doctors, I said, uh, I ride horses. Am I going to be able to ride horses? They said, Amberly, that's going to be impossible. So 10 days later, after being in Wyoming, I get brought back to Utah for therapy. Before I tell you, I need three more volunteers. Oh, come on. One, two, three. OK, good. So in this bag, I have three items. Each of these guys are going to pull out one item, and then I'm going to tell you what you have to do when you pull that item out. You want to go first? Yeah. Okay. Show them what you got. It's a little leopard pink scarf. So you just need to put that on and give us your best model walk across this stage. I'm not doing it. You're going to do it. <laughs> you do it. Okay. Here, we'll watch out. Just model walk for us all. <laughs> oh, yeah. Perfect. That's all you got to do. OK, who's next? All right. Show them what you got. A little chicken. You're just going to need to give us your best chicken imitation. Oh, my gosh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Give a round of applause for a chicken invitation. OK, last but not least. Show them what you got. Snickers bar. Snickers bar. You're not allergic, right? No. I just need you to open it up and take a bite. Really? Yep. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it, I promise. Like, it's just a Snickers bar. Okay, that's it. Give him a round of applause. Okay, you guys can go sit down. I'll take my scarf. Thank you. Okay, thank you guys for your help. So, you can keep, yeah, you're, I'm not taking that back. So, in this bag, there were three items. None of them knew what they were going to be. They could have chose to do them or not. I didn't really give them that option. But they could have said no. Just like life, you never know what you're going to draw out. You never know what obstacle you're going to be given. It might be something kind of embarrassing. It might be something that's hard. It might be something that's great. But it's up to you how you're going to react to that situation. So I get brought back to Utah for therapy. My nurse walks in and she says, Amberly, we need to set some goals. I said, easy. Walk, ride, rodeo. That's all I care about. That's it. That's all I want. She gave me this look like, you are crazy. Wasn't long before I realized it was going to be harder than that. That I was going to have to learn how to get myself from my wheelchair to my bed, or to another chair, or to in a car. That I was going to have to learn how to wheelie, or that I was even going to have to learn how to get dressed in the morning. Everything was hard. Once I was able to leave the hospital, I still had my big goals. What was the first one? 
walk. So when I left, I got these avatar legs made. That's what I call them because I feel like that's the color that they are. And I can put those on and I can stand in them as leg braces. That picture on the bottom is the very first day that I stood in them. Awesome feeling, guys. To be able to stand on your own two legs after you've been in a wheelchair for, I don't know, at that point it had only been a couple months, was awesome for me. Second part, what was it? Ride. So that part was a little bit trickier. The first day I got on a horse, I realized every part of my life was different. I had this expectation that riding was going to be the only part of my life that didn't change. It did. I had to get a seatbelt made. You guys can see that picture on the top. That's a seatbelt that I have on my saddle. We cut it out of a junkyard car, and I have it so that I can ride. Third part, rodeo. So when I could very first lope a barrel pattern, it was on a Saturday, I entered on a Monday. I absolutely love this. And I didn't care if the doctors told me it was impossible. If you love something, don't let somebody else tell you that you can't do it. So I want to show you guys a video um, of kind of just what I've gone through writing.
it's kind of been a, you know, a journey to make it through having everything in your life go right to having it swept out from underneath you to then having to come back. Everyone in here can have experiences like those. I mean, you're going to have those times where you're going to feel knocked down and you're going to feel discouraged. But it's going to be up to you to keep going. So just because you overcome the big ones doesn't mean that it's easy from here on. You know, you overcome that big mountain. Is it going to be smooth sailing? No. Some obstacles that I've had to just do all the time is being able to drive. I have hand controls in my truck. Being able to get on and off a horse, I have to get lifted on. Learning how to weld, I was kind of nervous to do that. The first day of welding class, my teacher told me he was going to hose me down if I lit on fire. There are these times that can still be challenging, but you can keep going. So I have one last story that I want to tell you about. So how many of you in here have shot a gun? Oh, right. I forget. We're at Snow College. Okay, so I had, the biggest thing I'd ever shot before my accident was a 22 rifle, not a very big gun. Well, I get this email that says, Amberly, do you want to come hunting? And I said, sure, you know, why not? So we go down to Monticello, and this guy on uh, my left, he's my guide. And I could hunt out of a truck, and I could hunt in this big field. So every night these deer would drop into this field. The first night that I'm there, the biggest thing that came into this field, it was like 5.30, when deer started coming, by 6.30, there was this really nice three-point. The guide said, don't shoot it. I'm going to get you something bigger. I said, okay, I trust you. The next day, we get up and we start hunting again. I don't even think we saw a squirrel. There was nothing. We go back to that same field that night, and 5.30 comes around, nothing. 6 o'clock rolls around like a doe and a spike. It's 6.20. Guys, the night before there was that nice three-point, which, gosh, if it had showed up, I was shooting it now. I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, hunting is the most boring thing I've ever done in my life. Well, I'm going to get a little religious on you for a second. So I said a little prayer, and I said, God, if you hear me, you listen to me, and you love me, send me a buck. <laughs> Can I just show you what came out of the brush? This guy. So 20 minutes later, he comes out of the brush, and he comes out on a mission. He has to come within a certain distance, guys. I've never shot a big gun. And uh, he's 250 yards away to start. Standing there, turns broadside. This is how you want to shoot a deer. He's too far away. So he comes in another 20 yards, turns broadside. <laughs> Still too far. 50 yards, turns broadside. Guys, this deer was for me. He finally comes where he is 100 yards away from me. So I had to shoot him. He now hangs on my mom's kitchen wall. <laughs> she loves it. But this was an experience that if I was not in a wheelchair, I would have never had. Seems crazy, right? Have you guys ever heard the saying, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade? So this is a lemon. I feel like most of the time I'm riding on a lemon. But there are experiences like these that are the lemonade experiences of life. Each of you can have those. You can have those experiences where you are having that sweet lemonade. I have a quote for you that it says, ability is what you are capable of doing, motivation determines what you do, and your attitude determines how well you do it. Everyone in here has a different ability. And guys, in our world, there are so many talented people. But our abilities are different. Your motivation is going to determine what you're going to do, and your attitude is going to determine how well you're going to do it. It's going to be the biggest part in your success. So, now what? I told you guys about my brother and the cat that they didn't realize, uh, well, they didn't give up. They never realized how close they were to success if they'd given up. Told you guys about my story, you know, there's times where I've been flipped over, like in the parking lot, where I've had to get the help to get back up. You guys are going to do that. Had these obstacles where life gives me lemons, but you can make lemonade. So you have to uh, keep going after all this. You have to set new goals. You have to make new dreams. The best part about dreams is there is no expiration date on them. 
So uh, one of my goals was graduating from Snow College. I did that. Guys, I survived. You guys can survive. And now attending Utah State, I have one semester left and then I graduate. Being able to break away rope, that was a thing that I had missed so much, was being able to rope. Got a seatbelt put on my rope saddle so that I can now do that on my college rodeo team as well. And uh, this picture on the other side, I don't know if any of you guys will recognize this, but this is the alleyway to the National Finals Rodeo in Las Vegas. It's like the Super Bowl for rodeo. I want to make it. There are these goals that you're going to keep making along your whole life. Everyone in here has the potential to be amazing. I mean, you guys already are. If the opportunity comes along for you to be greater, take it. If you have the chance to work hard to accomplish something, do it. But if each of you in here give up, what are you going to accomplish? Maybe nothing. Maybe something, but you never know. The last quote I have for you is there is no future in giving up. If each of you in here leave here with only one thing, I would challenge you all that no matter what you face or are facing, don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on the support around you. Don't give up on your friends, but don't give up on yourself because you can accomplish everything you want as long as you're going to work for it. With that, thanks for letting me come and speak. So I don't know what time it is. What time is it? So if any of you guys have questions that you want to ask, you can ask them now. Otherwise, oh, right here. So she asked when I have those lemony days what I do. So those happen. I can't sit up here and tell you that every day is a happy day, but I allow myself to be upset sometimes because, guys, being in a wheelchair sucks. So I allow myself to be upset, but then I have to look at it as, okay, this is how it is right now, but what am I going to do with it tomorrow? And I just set a new goal. As long as I'm progressing, I always can feel like I can be okay. So that's how I handle that. Back there. Am I involved at the FFA at USU? Uh, I'm a member of the collegiate officer team. But I, sir, I mean, I had an, a lot of leadership roles, and so I didn't run for an office up there because I felt like everyone should have the chance to be an officer. So I'm involved. You should get involved, but not an officer. Any other questions? Right here. I am not a mathematician. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, you guys can go then. Thanks.